Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's drama talk is given by Robert Coho Epstein. Uh, in the 60s or 70s, a long time ago, <laughs> I get those decades mixed up, but it was a time when Venerable Unsan and I were much younger. <laughs> um, Baba Ram Das, uh, who later dropped the Baba from his name, um, and unlike uh, Dafri John, didn't replace it with Da, but just cut it out entirely and just called himself Ram Das, uh, wrote a book that was one of the explosive engines, literary engines that spread Eastern philosophy throughout the counterculture of the US and made it seem very attractive. And uh, it was called Be Here Now. In addition to being a popular bestseller, the title became the motto of the new Western spiritual movement. People would say be here now quite a bit. Maybe they, after a while, it seemed like maybe they were saying it a little bit too much. Um, hey, be here now. Um, and it's a pretty concise and inclusive motto. Uh, if you don't overuse it, but just actually look at it, it's pretty, pretty good. Um, to be here now means to be present, to be focused, to be where you are and not somewhere else. And it also sums up what many consider the main agenda of Zen, uh, at least half or three quarters of Zenis, um, to stop being spun around by the constant stream of thoughts, distracted from life and from where you actually are, what you're actually doing, and to come in for a landing, as I like to say, since for some reason I think of myself as an airplane, into the body and the senses and the present time and place where you are. And surely, no matter how you look at it, that is a large portion of the Zen program, and it's a very important factor in all of the Eastern disciplines. Um, another aspect of, of Zen as part of Mahayana Buddhism uh, which is being attentive to other people and being helpful rather than hurtful, reducing rather than increasing suffering is also facilitated by this motto. If you're not here, focused in the present place and time with your mind, body and senses, how can you be aware of others and how they're doing and be helpful? Um, if you're caught up in your own thoughts about yourself, you probably are not going to notice as much what going on with other people and that is a problem with a lot of relationships um not for zen people though because we do better <laughs> um let's imagine that someone you're with is very sad about something but they're not talking about it. <clears throat> you can imagine a scenario in which you come to visit that person and start rattling on about what you've been doing without really looking at them and you don't notice what the other person's condition is. And then imagine another situation in which you start the visit by focusing on them and you see that they're sad and you say, hey, what's up? How are you doing? And you pay attention to them and create an opening to find out what's on their mind and be supportive. A much uh, better relationship, even though there's no good and bad. Uh, so two very different situations and the crucial ingredient is be here now, because if you're not present, you can't perceive what's going on. Be here now thus sounds very practical, like you're ready to, you're aware and you're ready to do whatever's called upon in the moment. But it also has an important word in it that can easily be overlooked and that might be of interest to people who are practicing uh, Zen um, if I say, hey, let's meet at the coffee shop, be there at 1 p.m., the emphasis is on the time. I'm saying show up at that time. The word be in that formulation is not that significant. But if I say be here now, and there's a lot of emphasis for most people who hear that statement about being here and being in the present, which is sort of what it means. But I'm not just telling you to be here as a location. 
or to be in the present moment, whatever that is, as it continuously goes by, which is also significant, but I'm telling you to be. Maybe there's also an option to not be, not really, but at least to not emphasize being and to just go rather unconsciously through the motions of the day and not realize that you are being the whole time. You're a living being. Um, so what about being aware that I'm being, that I be? And is it possible to be more in touch with being or less in touch with being? What if I interpreted be here now to mean, well, now that you're finally here, be, exist. Focus on the fact that you're a conscious being and that this is where you are. Whatever is in your mind or senses or body at any given moment is taken in by that which experiences your awareness or experiencing. And that is what makes us different from rocks or robots. Very important point. Um, AI can't do that. They don't experience anything. When I identify myself, I say, I am Robert, so I'm signing my being to this persona. But what if I just said, I am, and left the Robert out? Be a little awkward socially. Somebody said, who are you? And I said, I am. Maybe they would think I was quoting the Bible. Um, what is that I amness? What does the I am or beingness consist of? let's say when I'm not focused on being Robert. Well, at that moment, I just am. I'm an aware being and I don't really need an identity to be that. I just am and I already am that. Then I can just be uh, here and now. In Zen, we sometimes focus on what it means to be in the basic identity of an aware being by asking who am I or what am I or what is my original face? My original face didn't have a name or a form and still doesn't, so what is it? And all of that is contained in the B of Be Here Now. Zen combines full, fully embodying the moment we are actually in with mind, body, and senses with a sense that this is not just a mechanical presence but an aware, awake presence. Um, being here, being now, being awake, being aware. And that combination of concrete embodiment and focused awareness is not really made up of two separate elements. It's one whole coming in for a landing in itself. So there's a very famous Zen koan to go back to being here now again that contains a similar sort of message. It's Joe Shu's famous formulation when asked for teaching by a new monk. A monk asked Joe Shu, I've just entered the monastery, please give me some guidance. How should I practice? Joshu said, have you eaten your rice porridge? The monk said, yes, I have eaten. Joshu said, then go wash your bowls. Very famous Zen koan. This very famous koan is sometimes used to define Zen as a very practically oriented concrete discipline that has to do with the completeness and efficacy of action. And it certainly is in many ways. And that's, well, not to get too off track, but that's also a, an attribute of Japanese culture. So it may be even more emphasized in, as, as Zen came to Japan. But Joshu's teachings are deceptively simple as well. Being aware of the bowls and not just the eating, one takes care of the next action. And instead of staying focused on oneself having eaten, as we normally do, one focuses on that which is beyond the self, the bowls in this case. Maybe a stretch, but that's how I'm looking at it. So you don't just take care of yourself, you also take care of the bowls. Take care of the inside and take care of the outside. Um, you eat your food and take care of yourself, but then there's everything else. Being in touch with everything around you is very different than merely being in touch with yourself. One of the Zen teachings is that inner and outer is an artificial distinction. 
And if you're thinking about yourself and your body and going around doing things, it seems kind of nonsensical. But it has to do with where your focus and where your identity is as well. If we eat our food but stay connected to the bowls, then inner and outer are connected, not separated. It's not that once I finish eating, the bowls don't mean anything anymore. They're just for me to get my food. I'm going to take care of the bowls too. Um, and what about the monk next to me and her bowls? If she's having difficulty and needs more time to eat, I can offer to wash her bowls too. So presence, mindfulness, and not self, that which is beyond our personal boundaries, begin to be implied in this simple koan about washing the bowls. Are we really connected to everything with no inside and no outside? Well, we can choose to connect or disconnect and move towards equalizing what appears to be our inner awareness and our outer awareness. In other words, our aware beingness, if you don't mind me using that word, can be contained in our little personal box or it can stretch out and connect to things that appear to be outside and then our sense of self expands as well to encompass these connections and myself is larger than my personal self. It may not be so easy to make and keep these connections and not fall into self-concern. So it's not that it's without its challenges to, to, to do that. When I'm thinking I am Robert, my being, my sense of existence is associated with being Robert, and that's it. If I just say I am, maybe that aware being without a name is a little more flexible. And maybe I can ask, who am I, instead of saying I am Robert. If I'm stuck in my thoughts, I may start thinking about when I'm going to eat next or that I didn't have quite enough porridge or that I didn't like the taste of the porridge or that it was too thin and washing the bowls is just another nuisance I have to deal with. Why do I have to wash my own bowls? Why can't the kitchen staff do it? So that creates a very small self. As it is said in the Lankavatara Sutra about the self-enlightened Pratyeka Buddhas who focus only on their own awakening, they enter into their own nirvana, but it is not the nirvana of the Buddhas. So be here now and wash your bowls. Thank you. <laughs>